Hi there, in today's video we're going to be looking at trig derivatives. So lots of trig from this point forward in the class. If you guys haven't printed out those cheat sheets yet, highly recommend it. You're going to need to have quite a few skills in trig moving forward, as you'll see today. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prove these two trig limits. Uh, they pop up all the time. And we actually need both of these to prove that the derivative of sine of x is what it is. So we're going to start here. So all the stuff we're doing today is really based on the proof of that first uh, trig limit. All right, everything we do today is basically based on this, as you'll see. So let's jump right in and prove that limit. So we're going to start with some geometry. Uh, the idea here is that we have this big circle with a sector here and this green region fits inside here, right? Here's O, here's A. So the length of this side is 1. And then here's O, here's B, and the length of this side is 1. And so the area of the green part is less than the area of the blue part. And then we're going to take this red part and stick it in there too. And the area of this red part will be bigger than the blue part because again, here's O, here's A. And from A to D, stick straight up so it's outside the circle, so it's going to be bigger. So the area of the green part is less than the area of the blue part, and that is less than the area of the red part up there. So the area of the sector of the circle is theta over 2 pi times pi. So I don't know how much uh, geometry you guys remember. But the area of a circle is pi r squared. So here's pi. Here's r. So r squared is 1. So it's just pi. So this is the area of the circle. And this is the fraction of the circle that theta takes up. So for example, if theta takes up a, qu a quarter of the circle, then this would be you know theta over 2 pi. Well, this would be pi over 2. Right, so theta is pi over 2, it takes up a quarter of the circle, so that would be 1 fourth, right? So it turns out that when you multiply this out, you get 1 half theta. So for the unit circle, the area of the circle is just half of the angle. And that should totally make sense, right? Um, just based on the geometry of how it works. So that's the area of this little red, uh, this, sorry, this little blue part. The, re oh, the red, let me do red and green. So the red part and the green part. So the red part here is just a right triangle, so it's 1 half base times height. Base is 1, height is tangent theta, because this is on the unit circle. It's actually, it's actually the definition of tangent, right? It, um, what you learned in trig. And here, uh, the area of this triangle is again 1 half base times height. The base again is 1, OA is 1. And the height here is sine theta, because this also sit, B is on the unit circle. And so we just combine all those um, regions together and we get this inequality, right? The area of the small triangle is less than the area of the sector and that's less than the area of the large triangle. And then we just plug in the values. So now what we want to do is some algebraic manipulations that help us prove that limit at the top of the page. So the first thing we're going to do is we actually want to turn this on the left side into the number 1. So we're going to multiply through by 2 over sine theta. And it turns uh, the value on the left into a 1. Then you can look through and see, well, it does some other weird stuff that we don't necessarily like. So we want to keep that thing a 1 on the left. So the way we do that so we actually just take the reciprocal of each term. And when we take the reciprocal of each term, we have to flip the inequalities. Now we have that sine theta over theta in the middle. That's what we wanted, right? Because we're trying to prove this. And over here, we have cosine. Well, cosine is nice because cosine is continuous. That means we can actually tack on a limit. So we tack that limit on. We're only looking at the positive for now, be, just because of that's how the diagram was drawn up. If you go back and look at this diagram, 
theta is positive, right? Theta is coming around, where's my camera? Theta is coming around like this, right? So it starts at a larger positive angle and gets smaller. So theta is positive approaching zero. So that's why we have to come in from the positive side at this point. So we just put limits on there, right? If you have functions, you can tack limits on and it doesn't change the value, right? Still, inequalities are still true, right? We saw that with our limit laws much earlier in the class. Now, what we have is this is a continuous function, this is a continuous function, so we can actually just evaluate the limits. Right? This this just goes right back to where we started. This becomes one again. But what, what's nice is over here, we can actually just plug in zero, right? The limit of cosine of zero, well, that's, this is a continuous function. We just plug it in. Cosine of zero is one. And so now we have this inequality, but wait, we're saying that this is a number between one and one? Well, that's the squeeze theorem, and that proves what we want. So what we've done is we've proven that the right side, so for positive angles of theta, this is true. I'm not going to go through the whole proof again for negative angles, but hopefully it's believable to you that I could do it again for negative angles. Everything works out exactly the same, except when you're done, you just have a minus sign in everything and just multiply through by negative one, and it flips the inequality, but squeeze theorem doesn't care which way the inequality goes, right? So it doesn't matter that it's negative, you get the same answer. All right, so that's how that works. So we could prove it for negative angles, uh, but it's a similar proof. And so we get uh, what we were trying to show, right? The limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over theta is one. Now this limit pops up absolutely all the time, sort of naturally in problems, in science, engineering, and things like that. Um, but we're going to use it to prove another limit. So we want to prove this limit, the second one we saw in that first slide. The limit uh, as theta approaches zero of cosine of theta minus one over theta is zero. So here's how you do this proof. You can see I copied this one out of the book because I didn't feel like retyping this one. So this is what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove this is zero. So what we do is we multiply by something like a conjugate right and we don't foil the denominator we do distribute the numerator this should look familiar right it looks like how we did conjugate stuff with derivatives earlier right uh, foil the numerator don't foil the denominator uh, we use the Pythagorean identity to replace this with negative sine squared now what we have is a theta in a denominator and a sine in a numerator so we can split that sign into two pieces we pull the negative to the front now we have a sine theta over theta, and this is just everything else. Distribute the limit. You, the, the negative you can put wherever you want. We just put in the front. This whole thing becomes one, so this thing together is negative one. And then we just plug in zero. Well, sine of zero is zero, so it doesn't matter what the denominator is because it's not zero. Zero divided by any non-zero value is zero. So this whole thing is zero. Negative one times zero is zero. So we just proved the first two formulas on that first slide. Those formulas we need to prove the next formula. And we're going to use those first two formulas to prove that the derivative of sine x is in fact cosine x. And it also turns out that the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. So let's go ahead and do the proof of the first formula. I could do the proof of the second one as well, but it looks really similar to the first one, so I just want to show you how you would do it using algebra and make it believable that we could prove these things for all of the trig functions that we encounter. So here's the proof that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. Just use the definition of derivative here, plug everything in, now once you get to here, you're like, oh, we're stuck. I don't know how to do sine x plus h. But you do. In trig, um, or maybe you, your class called it pre-calc. Um, in trig, you learned of the sine of angle sum formula. So here we, these are both angles. x and h are both angles. 
So if you add two angles, you can rewrite this expression as this, right? Sine x cosine h plus cosine x plus sine h. And then this minus sine x just sticks around. Once we get to here, now we can reassemble everything. So we just move this sine x over here and put it over h. Take this and put it over h and put it here. So we're just, we're, we're, we're rearranging and separating one larger expression into two smaller expressions. Then we factor the sine x out of this expression, factor the cosine x out of this expression. Then we push these limits through everything. This limit here, uh, we already know what it is. We saw it in the last example, it's zero. And this limit here, we saw what that was, that's one. Right, so the limit as h approaches zero of sine x is, this is a continuous function, but there's no h. I would say plug in h equals zero, but there's no h to plug in, so it's just sine x. But this is zero, right, we proved that. Here, we have cosine x, plug in h equals zero. There's no h, so it just stays cosine x. Multiply it by this value here, which is one. So this is zero, it goes away, this is one, so you get cosine x. And the proof of the derivative of cosine x is similar. I'm not gonna do it, I just want you guys to know this first one, just so you know, you know, that it's believable and that if you forget the derivative, you could prove it on your own. So let's start using derivatives to solve some problems. So here we have the derivative of sine x times cosine x. So some of you might be thinking, oh, I know the derivative of sine x, I know the derivative of cosine x, I'm just going to plug it in. But that's not how this works, right? In the previous section, we saw that when you have a product, you have to use the product rule. So we actually need to kind of specify what rule we're using. And as before, we want to use operators. Here I'm using the prime notation, or the if you want to call it an apostrophe, that's, pr that's fine, but we call it prime. And then you just plug everything into the formula, right? So f is sine x, uh, cosine is, uh, is g, so cosine x is g. Plug everything in, take the derivatives, so derivative of cosine x is negative sine x, derivative of sine x is cosine x. Simplify, and if you want to do one more step, it would be fine like that on a test, but you might want to rewrite it just to make it look nice. Either one of those last two lines is fine as a, as a final answer. The homework would accept either one. Let's keep rolling. So here's the derivatives of the other trig functions. We are gonna prove the first two in the next example. So the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. The derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. The derivative of cotangent x is negative cosecant squared x. And the derivative of cosecant x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. So y'all might be thinking, oh man, this is too much to remember. You get to use formula sheets on the exams. But you still might be thinking, well, what about next year? What about when I go to Calc 2 at Ohio State or Miami or Toledo or Bowling Green? They're not going to let me use formula sheets. And you have to memorize these. So here's some ways to remember these. The derivatives of sine and cosine only contain sine and cosine, right? We saw that on an earlier slide. The derivative of secant and tangent only contains secants or tangents. The derivatives of cosine and co sorry, cotangent and cosecant only contain cotangent and cosecant. Any, oh, the derivative of any co-function is negative. And the derivative of anything that has the word tangent in it is something squared. So those are three mnemonics that you can use to remember these things, right? That they come in groups of two and they only contain each other in the derivatives. So let's prove the first two formulas here. All right, so let's start with the first one. So you guys might be looking at this and thinking, 
Oh man, I don't know how to do this. Right? But we do know how to do derivatives of sine and cosine. So maybe that's a good place to start. And we saw that earlier in, a, in an example um, where sometimes it's easier to simplify first. While here, we're taking tangent and breaking it into simpler pieces. Like we know what to do with sine and cosine. So here we have sine and cosine, but it is there's a division going on there, so we need to use the quotient rule. Notice here my operators that I'm using are the ddx symbols. Make sure you're using your operators. Then you go ahead and evaluate the derivatives. Simplify, but we're not done. Right? In the previous problem, we were basically done after we simplified, but in this one, we're definitely not. Cosine squared x plus sine squared x is 1. So we need to use our Pythagorean identity to, uh, to show that that's what it is. And now we are ready to take one last step and say that that's secant squared. So if you're wondering why, on a test, how much work do I show? Well, something like this. Every step has to be justified unless it is simple arithmetic, foiling, factoring, things like that. But anything that involves trig, anything that involves more complicated operations, you have to show the work. Let's look at the next one. Derivative of secant x. Right? Well, let's rewrite that as 1 over cosine x. We know what to do with cosines. We know how those derivatives work. Use quotient rule again. Evaluate your quotient rule. And what happens here is that this is a, this derivative of 1 is 0, so this whole thing goes away. Uh, distribute this negative, so we get sine x over cosine squared x. You can't leave it like this. Because this problem, we're proving that this is secant x tangent x. So you have to split that in two pieces like by factoring, and then show that that's secant x tangent x. That's how you have to do it. All right, and make sure you guys are working on how to prove the other two, because those could be on a test. So now let's look at sort of a more realistic problem. So what, is, what do problems with trig functions look like in calculus, sort of in their natural environment? So here we have a function, secant x over 1 plus tangent x, and we want to know where does the graph of this function have a horizontal tangent and vertical tangent. So we have to find the derivative first, and then we have to solve for those other values. So let's go ahead and find the derivative. So you're looking at it, and you might think, oh, quotient rule. Okay, good thought. But if I do the quotient rule here, I'm going to end up with a 1 plus tangent x in a denominator, right? And, and actually, what the quotient rule becomes squared. And so you have to think, is that something that you want to deal with? Or maybe we want to use sines and cosines like we did before. I'm not saying it's always best to use sines and cosines. Every problem is different. You have to just do what works. Sometimes seeing the examples, it looks so easy, right? Students always say that. Well, when you do it, when you show me the examples, it looks easy. Well, yeah, but I had to try it a bunch of different ways to figure out the best way to do it. I'm only showing you what I found to be the best way. You might have to try other ways for other problems. So here, I just rewrite secant using cosine. I rewrite tangent using sine over cosine. And this makes it very clear that there's a cosine in a denominator. So multiply through by cosine. And what that does is it clears out all the denominators, right? This reduces to 1. This cosine goes over here, and then this part just becomes a sine. So I'd much rather deal with this than this. So now, let's take the derivative, right? So the derivative of that is the same as the derivative of that, because they're the same function, they're just written differently. Quotient rule again, of course. And you're probably kind of starting to see some patterns, right? Anytime there's a constant in the top, 
this first part's going to go away because this is we're taking the derivative of a constant, which will be zero. And then this just stays the same, right? It's just because it's one uh, times the derivative of that over the denominator squared. So evaluate your derivatives. This is going to be zero over here. This whole thing becomes zero. This negative gets distributed, so we're going to get sine x minus cosine x in our numerator. And we're actually just going to keep the denominator the way it is. This is the answer. You don't have to go any farther. You're allowed to keep simplifying. But it turns out that you, you don't gain any advantage by continuing to simplify, even though you're allowed to do it. The part B of this problem does not get easier if you keep simplifying. So you might as well stop there, right? Because this is fine on a test. It's fine for the homework. If you guys are using the homework tutor, if you're looking stuff up online, if you're checking stuff on Wolfram Alpha, if you're watching videos on YouTube, other videos, you may see it's sort of a thing in math where some folks like to sort of compulsively simplify. You're not required to do it in my class. I can't imagine you'd be required to do it in a future math class either. Because the farther you go in math, sort of the more different things you can do with problems. And this is actually the best form to solve anything we'd have to do. Simplifying it might not actually be better for solving certain factors, as we're going to see in the next example. So in part B, we want to find the horizontal tangent, so we set the derivative equal to 0. So even if you simplified this thing, would it really be more helpful? Well, we're solving, we're setting the derivative equal to zero. This is a fraction. But the only way a fraction can be zero is if the numerator is zero. This is already very, very simple, right? Divide by cosine and solve. So this is just pi over four and then, you know, n multiples of pi plus pi over 4. Not a ton of algebra there. Right? Looks like something you did in trig. What about vertical tangents? Well, a vertical tangent is where there's a vertical asymptote, right? Vertical asymptotes only happen when you divide by 0. So that tells us that we should just set the denominator equal to 0, right? Because it's division by 0. So that makes sense. So here we set the denominator equal to 0. And because we're setting it equal to 0, we can take the square root of both sides without needing that plus or minus. Remember, if you're setting just any two expressions equal to each other, and then taking the square root, you need a plus or minus. Unless one of those sides is 0. Because negative 0 is the same as 0, so the plus or minus goes away. So this is a really nice feature. Leaving this denominator unsimplified actually helps us a lot because this is easy to solve. Divide through by cosine and solve it as you normally would. So we have horizontal tangents at places shown on the previous slide. We have vertical tangents here. Go ahead and draw the graph and you can check your answer and you will see that it is in fact true where your horizontal and vertical tangents lie. So even if you didn't know what the function looked like, you could probably sketch it just knowing that there's vertical asymptotes and horizontal tangents. And the function can never be zero, right? It doesn't cross the x-axis, right? You can see that here that it doesn't cross the x-axis. OK, let's keep rolling. So now we're going to investigate higher derivatives of sine x. So let's find the first six derivatives and see what happens. So we're f of x is sine x. First derivative um, is the derivative of sine x, which is cosine x. We proved, we proved that. The second derivative is just the first derivative of the first derivative. So it's just the derivative of cosine x, which is negative sine x. We didn't prove it, but I could if you wanted me to. You can prove all of these. Um, 
Next up, third derivative. Well, that's just the first derivative of the second derivative. And now we have that negative, that pesky negative in there. So let's just pull that negative out, like pull constants out. It just makes life easier. So it's the negative derivative of sine x, which is negative cosine x. Looks easy enough. What about the fourth derivative? So it's the derivative of negative cosine. Pull that pesky negative to the front. Derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. So we have negative negative sine x, which is sine x. And now we're back to where we started. So the fourth derivative is the same as the original function. Is that always going to be true? Well, it turns out it is because look here when we take the fifth derivative. If our original function was cosine, four derivatives later, we're right back where we started. So if you start with sine, cosine, negative sine, or negative cosine, and take four derivatives, you end up where you started. And so we can summarize this with this little table that I came up with. So for k, a uh, whole number starting at 0, um, the 4k derivative is sine x, the 4k plus 1 is cosine x, and so on and so forth. What about the 27th derivative? All we have to do to find the 27th derivative is figure out which pattern it fits. Well, 24 is less than 27, so k could be 6. So if, if, if k is 6, 24, 25, 26, 27th derivative needs to be negative cosine. And that's how you do problems like this. You count backwards until you get a multiple of 4, and then you count forward again on this table. I could ask you a question like this involving cosine as well. The rule is the same for cosine. Just every fourth derivative it repeats in this same pattern. All right. So the last example we're going to see today is how to do some more advanced limits in trig. So the first one looks sort of like sine of theta over theta. So do you think this limit is going to be 1, right? Because you might think, well, we plug in 0 over, so sine of 0 over 0, earlier it looked like that was 1. Is this going to be 1? Well, it turns out that's not true. You can't just plug in unless the function is defined at the point. 0 over 0 is not defined. And if you try to plug in x equals 0, you'll get 0 divided by 0. So just because it looks similar to something you've seen before doesn't make it the same. Got to remember your rules of limits. You can only plug in if it's continuous. So the trick to this problem is just multiplying by 2 over 2. What you do is you match whatever this coefficient is here, just put 2 over 2. Just So if, if that's a 6, put 6 over 6. Then you swap the denominators. Because limit laws say we're allowed to take multiplication and division inside and out of limits. Now this sort of is beginning to look like sine of theta over theta. So you just say, let theta be 2x. And you do a replacement, just a variable replacement. And notice that you have to change the limits as well, right? So here, when x was getting closer to 0, 2x gets closer to 0. That means theta gets closer to 0. Well, this thing now we can evaluate. This is just 1. We proved that earlier in the slides. So that's just 1. So the answer is 2 thirds. So some of you out there are thinking, hey, you're just writing this 2 and this 3 down here and here. That's correct. I am just doing that. But that is not uh, sort of a appropriate way to show work because on a test, you might have a problem that looks similar to this, but different. So you always got to make sure you're not looking for shortcuts. If there is a shortcut that you can use, I will put it in the notes and I will tell you to use it. This is not one of those cases. Because what happens if you have a problem like this? There's no shortcut that you can use that you can just plug in and say, oh, you're just taking this, that, and the other. 
So how do we solve a problem like this? Well, I'm going to use a similar approach to what I've used before. I'm going to break everything into sines and cosines again, just to make it easier to look at. So sure, the algebra gets uglier, but I kind of know more what's going on. So here I'm just using the fact that tangent of 2x is sine of 2x over cosine of 2x, just replacing it. So this sort of tells me what I need to do. I need to get rid of this cosine of 2x. So I'm going to multiply by a fact through by a factor that has a cosine of 2x in a numerator. And then I need to get a 3x in the denominator of this. So that's actually what I'm going to multiply through by. This cosine of 2x, I got to get rid of this denominator. And this 3x in the, in the denominator is going to put a 3x up here, which is going to help me there. Because that will allow me to use the sine theta over theta rule. So this expression is going to let us simplify it. So then I'm just going to distribute everything through. And yes, I know it's getting horrible, but just bear with it. This 3x stays in the denominator over here. And so I'm just moving, I'm just like moving that denominator over basically. So this cosine is here. So this I'm going to group separately and use the sine theta over theta. Uh, this stays the same. Down here, I just distributed, right? So cosine 2x, 3x, and x. And here, sine 2x, cosine 2x, cosine 2x, 3x. And here's what's going to happen on the next slide. I'm going to push all those limits through. So here, my limit laws say that as long as the functions are defined everywhere except possibly here, I can push those limits through. So I'm going to rewrite this limit in four different places. Here, 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 and here. Then I'm going to cancel what I can. I'm going to cancel these two x's. Good. That'll let. So by canceling this x in the denominator, I'll be able to find that limit. And here I'm going to cancel these cosine two x's. And push all those limits through. So that's what I did. Canceled the x's here, canceled the cosine two x's here. Now we just look at all the different components and see if we know how to evaluate them. Here I'm going to be able to say theta equals 3x, so I know how to deal with that. This is a continuous function. I can plug in 0. I know how to deal with that. This is a continuous function. I can plug in 0. And here, that problem should look familiar because we just solved it in the previous problem. right? Part A of this example, we solved that. And so this is the same rationale here that we used here. right? But So if this is like a brand new problem on a test or something or on a homework, you're going to have to do side work in two different places, possibly. And that's OK. Get used to doing side work in a class like this. Well, we know what all these are, right? This is just going to be 1. This is just going to be cosine of 2 times 0, which is going to be 1. Uh, cosine of 2 times 0 again is 1, but that's over 3, so that's going to be a third. And we already know that this is 2 thirds. So you plug everything in. Notice we're able to use substitution on, the, on these two. Even though we weren't able to use substitution here, we are able to use them here. And just multiply everything out and add everything up and you get one. So at the beginning of the problem, there's no way that you guys thought that this was about to be, the answer was going to be one. And in fact, when you're doing the homework, you might do a problem like this and get a really simple answer and go, that can't be right. Check your answer, right? Graph the function and just look. Does it look believable that the answer is 1? Well, it sure does, right? So as x comes in here and here, it certainly looks like it's getting closer to 1. And that's the answer, and you're good to go. So that's the end. Um, so here's your uh, practice problems and book exercises. Make sure that you guys are uh, working through stuff as you see fit. You know, So if you're having trouble, do more of this stuff. If you're feeling good about it, though, keep feeling good. And as usual, if you have questions, you can shoot me questions via email or on Canvas in the discussion forum. Either one's fine. And don't forget that you can check out these online resources below. They're very cool and a lot of times give you insights that we really don't have time to do in a short video on this section. So that's it today, guys. If you have any questions, let me know. And I'll see you next video. Bye-bye.